correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, was all the president's men an adaptation from Woodward and yeah. Bernstein's book? Okay. Yeah. So the dialogue and that and the and, and the, the, the running, I, I just remember in so many scenes they were running and, and can you talk about that script in any way? You know, I, I'm not as familiar with it. Okay. Stories. I, I mean, with the script as I'd like to be, because I mean, I'd like to have recently read the book and sure, the script. Sure. But one of the things that you do in a story like that is that you you add the running, because there probably isn't a lot of running in real life. Right. I mean, these journalists are probably too heavy to be running, <laughs> and, and they don't look like Robert Redford probably either. Yeah. yeah well, <laughs> some of them might, but they're not. You know, but but I think that that's what the big challenge, like spotlight. Is, is an example. Yeah. They took a lot of lot of reporting from Boston Globe and, and turned it into a dramatic movie that covered, you know, collapsed many years into a few years. Uh, you, you have to take those liberties, and that's why you end up saying inspired by a true story instead of based on a true story, et cetera. Uh, I've been through that many times. But adding action, adding drama is what you have to do. Right, in the scene in Spotlight where Stanley Tucci, you don't see him yet, you just hear him yelling at his assistant, and so I think something's thrown, and then the look on Mark Ruffalo's face, and, and that right there is enough to, to right. kind of set the stakes. You know, exactly, it's and it's, exa it's, it's good drama because it involves the audience immediately because you don't see what's happening, so you see a reaction to what's happening, so you have to figure out what's happening, and one of the common mistakes that you know, younger writers make is that they patronize the audience by explaining too much, by thinking that every single thing has to be, you know, there. And when I always say that when you're editing, like the top 10 rules of editing are all the same cut, 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 cut. Because when you're in doubt about whether you need something, that alone is a reason for cutting it. Just cut it. You don't need it. The audience will make the jump and will fill in the blanks. And if you don't let them fill in the blanks, it's called painting by the numbers, then you, you come across as patronizing to the audience and they, they get bored. They don't want to hear every detail. You don't have to say your honor in a court scene every, every single sentence. Uh, or you don't have to say the character's name every time you talk to the character. I mean, these are, people get, get that out of their system after 10 years of writing, but at the beginning, you don't know where the lines are. And the sense of the audience, I mean, one of the things I like to talk about is the psychology of the audience. Like, it's not the psychology of the author that makes you read a book. You don't care about that. You know, it's just like you're listening to your friend talk about his uh, latest ballot in the hospital. I mean, how much do you care about how he felt about every, you know, you, you pretend you care as long as you can, but if he has any sense at all, he'll keep it, keep it, you know, cut it down, right? And the truth is, you don't care about the psychology of the characters either. That's not what's important. What's important is your psychology, as always, the audience's psychology. And that's why Hitchcock and Peter Weir really know what they're doing. That, that drive away in Witness is one of the most brilliant parts of the film because of the length of the driveway. So it was a location choice. He's telling the location manager, I need a place that has a long, long, long driveway that will give me a 60 second tracking shot. You know, and in The Birds, when the heroine takes this flashlight without even testing whether it works or not and starts heading up the, the wooden steps because she hears rustling in the attic, you know, that is the longest walk up the steps you've ever seen in a film because it is so stupid that the audience needs at least three or four steps to get it out of their system, saying, oh, come on. Why is it every actress, and why does she have to have white underwear on? Why is it always at the end of a horror film? And why doesn't she test that, you know? So once you get past that, okay, now she's on the middle step, and then you go through like, oh my God, why is she, you know, this doesn't make any sense. I, I can't stand this, I don't wanna watch this. And then a few more steps, and by the time she gets to the top step, you're ready, like, okay, I paid to get scared, this is it. And, and that is using the psychology of the audience, that's the timing that the audience needs to get into the exact right mood. You know, it's just like the speech in Julius Caesar where Mark Anthony comes up after Brutus's brilliant speech on the, you know, corpse of, of Caesar, and Anthony comes up and praises, you know, Brutus's speech and calls him the Honorable Brutus. And uh, 
by the end of his speech, he's turned the entire crowd against Brutus, even though they were all cheering for Brutus at the beginning of his speech. He takes the psychology of the audience and twists it around in a way that, you know, you can see it coming, but you don't care. You just want to go there with him. Uh, and, and it's not about Anthony's, nobody cares about Anthony's psychology, you know, and nobody cares about Brutus's psychology there. That's not important. And nobody cares about Shakespeare's psychology because nobody knows what his psychology is. They said, you know, the greatness of Homer and Shakespeare, that they themselves were nowhere to be found in their work. Their characters were everywhere. And the characters speak directly to the audience. You know, and that, that's the hardest thing about writing is figuring that out.